Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Hello. It's good to see so many of you here this afternoon for this session on third party risk. Uh, my name, I hope, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, so, my name is Dean, and I'm part of the, the risk sales specialist team here at Thomson Reuters, but based out of Hong Kong. Uh, and I'll be doing a very quick sort of introduction, trying to set the scene, you know, talk about what, you know, what we've seen so far. And to us, a lot of um, the content that we'll be discussing today has come from a lot of the conversations that I certainly have, uh, have had with, uh, with a lot of clients and companies you know, who are having uh, issues and struggling to manage and deal with third party risk. And I think there's so many of you here, I think it's a great reflection that a lot of you also feel the same way. Right? I mean, if we have a look at you know, what really drives third party risk, sorry, it's, it's a bit echoey. Um, you know, I've broken it down into, into three main areas. Right? Uh, the first being you know, regulatory non-compliance. And I think a lot of it started with the, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, and you know, the prevention of bribery of foreign government officials. And of course, the UK came along with their version of it. But what we're also seeing is there's more and more regulation, more rules coming out, including the Modern Day Slavery Act, you know, which is you know, directing and telling companies how to do business, where to do business, and the best practices that they should be adopting in order to do business the right way. Right? Reputational damage, uh, you know, the most valuable asset a company has. Right? So what can you do to protect that? What can you do to enhance it? Uh, you know, we've seen lots of case studies, and I'll go through a couple, of the, a couple of them during this introduction, about where we've seen you know, companies getting the headlines for the wrong reasons. And part of today's discussion is seeing what you know, we can do, what you know, companies can implement to make sure they do stay out of uh, the headlines. Uh, and finally, you know, the third aspect is really around stakeholder risk, um, whether it's shareholders, internal stakeholders, whether it's NGOs, and actually NGOs have become large, very influential when it comes to um, directing companies or advising companies on you know, how to do things and what best practices to implement. Uh, so we'll explore that as well a little bit. And then the key thing, really, is it's, it is on government agenda, right? A lot of what we do, especially in the risk and compliance space, is driven by regulation. It's driven by the government saying, we expect companies to do this. Uh, so, you know, we've got things like the UK Modern, Day, uh, Modern Slavery Act that's coming out, expecting companies to put into place policies, procedures, and document and prove what they're doing to try and mitigate risks uh, around slavery and bonded labor. Uh, of course, FCPA, you've got conflict minerals, and you've got things like you know, the, the Thai fishing uh, seafood industry now, right? I mean, Thai seafood is what the third largest exporter of seafood globally, uh, but you know, they're on this yellow card as of last year, uh, due to the fact that it was found that you know, slavery was involved, or human trafficking, or bonded labor was used as part of the production uh, and manufacturing redistribution of seafood from Thailand. I think we're still waiting, is that right, Steve? Still waiting on the outcome from the EU, but whether or not that yellow is going to go to a red. Um, but you know, I think it's a great reflection of the importance that governments are taking to ensure you know, they stand this out and get rid of um, you know, issues like slavery. Uh, if we talk about FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, anyone know the relevance of this one? Uh, 2011, small, uh, small incident in India. Uh, so the company that distributes uh, Johnny Walker in India was, was fined uh, for bribing basic government officials in India uh, for their sales agents for basically trying to promote and. Uh, this particular brand in a lot of government stores in, in across India. Uh, and that is an issue there around with the sales, with the agents, with the, with the distribution channels. Right? Uh, you know, so for certain companies, and you know, it's, it's important to understand where the risks lie. Uh, you know, and again, that's something we'll explore today. Uh, so for this particular company, it was around their distribution where they had the biggest challenge. Uh, anyone know the issue on the left? I think the, the shape gives it away somewhat. Absolutely. <laughs> So in 2013, uh, it was actually Tesco's was in the news uh, for the fact that their hamburger meat and their frozen uh, burgers was actually made of horse meat rather than beef. Um, and actually, the interesting thing about this one is it was a reflection of the complexity of the supply chain that I think was the issue. Right? Um, so when we looked at the, the actual web and the diagram, we're looking at maybe five, six layers in terms of supplies going down the line before we actually got to the crux of the issue. Because the Tesc, from Tesco's perspective, their supply was, I think, like Liechtenstein, and they came up, you know, that's fine, there's nothing wrong. But they were, of course, outsourcing or outsourcing or outsourcing. And I think it's that complexity of the supply chain that poses a lot of the challenges to many, uh, well, many of our customers, certainly many, and I'm sure you guys as well. Now, how about the run on your left? Also happened at the same time, uh, more local. Uh, this one's probably a little bit more off-putting, actually. Um, so this was uh, Hong Kong Customs seized, I think it was 10, 000, uh, 10 tons of fake beef coming in from China. All right, so the supplier and the distributor basically spray painted pork to make it look like beef. 
Okay. Um, and again, you know, issues like this we, we see a lot. This is fairly regular. I mean, I'm sure you, all of you are familiar in Hong Kong with the melamine scandal with the tainted milk from, from China. You know, so ensuring then the quality of the products and ensuring your suppliers you know, are doing things the right way, are producing things the right way, is fundamental. Because at the end of the day, it's not really the supplier who gets in trouble. It's the company who's distributing. Right? And again, there's another issue. In Australia last year, I'm not sure you're familiar with the tainted berries. Uh, but it was found that berries in Australian schools were tainted with hepatitis A. And that was from a packaging plant uh, in China before they were shipped to Australia. Uh, and you know, you know, for me, I think this is a nice sort of reflection of you know, the, the challenges and the complexities that a lot of our customers face. You know, it is supply chains do seem to be getting more complex, you know, and people are finding it harder to, to, to manage them. And then where does that responsibility lie? You know, if you've got a supply chain you know, three, four layers down, is it our client's responsibility to manage what happens four layers down? Or, you know, or do they have to enforce their customer and their supplier and their supplier's supplier to implement certain policies, procedures, you know, due diligence, et cetera? Fairly recent, these two. Fairly, I think this has made quite big headlines, actually. Um, do you know what they have in common? Yeah, OK, so 2014, uh, both were found to be sourcing um, from the Raja Plaza factory in Bangladesh, which collapsed. Right? And, and actually, for me, I think this is one of the biggest triggers in terms of slavery and bonded labor. Because uh, uh, from this, then a whole bunch of slavery issues really came out. Um, but and putting it into context, I mean, I think a lot of the companies in general, I don't think want that sort of headline to be associated with their entity. And so what can they do to stay out the headlines? What can they do to stay in the papers for the right reasons? I mean, I don't think Primark wanted to have Primark mass industrial homicide next to them. I don't think, you know, their marketing people would have been too happy about that. This one, I'm sure this is quite a famous one. Anyone know what that one is? Foxconn, and the fact I think it was 14 people committed suicide at Foxconn factories, at uh, the Foxconn factory, due to poor working conditions, basically forced labor. Uh, and, you know, put Apple in, in the, completely the wrong light, and the light that they didn't want to be in. Uh, they actually had another incident uh, last year as well with another one of their suppliers in China. Now, we, we mentioned NGO pressure. Um, and I, I had, a, had a chat with uh, the program director for the WWF not too long ago. Uh, and he made quite an interesting statement, and he said that actually NGOs are the ones who initiate a lot of these, um, <coughs> so initiate a lot of the uh, uh, public, yeah, there you go, position, position. there you go. Um, you know, and they go, this is an issue, let's do something about it, and then people follow suit. Um, and you know, this is just an example of that, so this is Brown Greenpeace with Project Detox. You know, where they wanted to ensure that companies in the fashion industry weren't using toxic dyes and chemicals as part of the production of their goods, because those, those dyes and chemicals were toxic to, to humans. Uh, so they then had you know, detox leaders, companies that said, yes, we're going to do it, and actually did something to change. Uh, and then they had greenwashers, so companies that um, said they would do something, but have yet to do it. Uh, they had the detox losers, but I decided to remove them from the, the slideshow. Now, something slightly different, even though it is around third-party risk, I promise you, um, anyone know who these people are? Almost, almost. So these guys, or well, these people, come from the ultimate fighting champion of the UFC. Right? Now the reason why I've thrown this up there, right, uh, is because the UFC, uh, you know, take their brand, take their reputation very, very seriously. And this is a great example of what they're doing in terms of being proactive, in terms of screening the people that represent the UFC with lots of money in front of, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of viewers. And they're basically saying that we don't want anyone with a criminal record, a bad background, people involved in um, you know, domestic abuse, representing be the face of UFC, which we're going to pay a lot of money for. And yeah, so the reason why I put this out there, because it's a slightly different perspective in the sense that this is a company being very proactive in terms of how they're managing uh, and mitigating you know, their reputational risks. But before we get into the, the panel, um, just a couple of things. Uh, one is please do ensure your uh, cell phones are off. Uh, and also, on your way out, uh, if you can just pick up one of these Trust Forum Asia flyers for an event that we're, we're hosting on the 28th of April in Singapore, uh, that would be good. Right. So I get to introduce the panel now. Uh, so sitting on my left is Steve Farrak, who's the financial crime consultant at Liberty Asia. Uh, gentleman there wearing the orange Thomson Reuters S tie is Soren, who's the <laughs> chief compliance officer for Manulife. 
Uh, and we're very lucky to have uh, Tara Joseph, who's the chief correspondent from uh, Reuters uh, TV, so moderating our session today. So please do get involved, um, and I'll pass it over to, to Tara. Dean, thanks very much, and um, welcome to everyone coming to this session. I've just realized in your introduction, Dean, that third-party risk sounds like a very technocratic, from my curious journalism stance, uh, what does third-party risk mean? Now I understand how human and diverse the topic really can be. So I'm going to start off with a few questions, but I want to make sure that we get the conversation going in the room today in terms of your questions, thoughts, and ideas on this topic. And I hope it's a conversation that we can continue throughout the year, because as we can see with society, we're just beginning to unravel what is a huge story and a huge kind of chain of progress uh, in our society and companies. So Soren, if I can start with you. You're in the insurance business, for goodness sakes. Um, risk should be something that you think of all the time. But in terms of third party risk, how do you define it? And, and how are you trying to unravel that in your business here in Asia? <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think historically, uh, we have treated this as a very technical aspect, right? Uh, third party. Historically, I think nobody really thought about it, if we're being honest, um, unless it was really very close to us and close to our business where intuitively we knew there was a risk. Um, through UK Bribery Act and other things, FCPA to some extent, I think it, it became again a very technical kind of aspect of the business and then we took it all on board and people translated third party as basically meaning your suppliers and to some extent agents. Um, but again, very, very technical. And I think uh, what, what Dean, I think, was very successful in showing is we have moved beyond the technical stage. So third party really, if we really think about it for all of our businesses, however diverse they may be, um, definitely suppliers, definitely if you're looking at the insurance business, um, Manulife has uh, over 60,000 agents uh, in Asia acting on behalf of Manulife with the Manulife logo, so they would definitely fall into your consideration. Uh, but also people that you service uh, upstream, uh, you know, if you're in banking and you're wide labeling products for sure, you've got to screen your partners, your business partners and so on and so forth. So we've got to look at this much more holistically than we used to. And of course, um, you know, playing on the thought of, of technical, I think uh, um, Dean mentioned a, a few things uh, and one thing that's very close to my heart is let us all move away from just this technical fulfillment of a requirement. Let's look at the human tragedy behind, or the environmental tragedy behind a lot of these cases. And I guarantee all of us will be doing third party due diligence much more effectively. Um, kind of, thanks for that introduction. You're, but you're sitting in an office in Hong Kong. You've got a massive territory around Asia. And you're trying to think how to mitigate those third party risks. I mean, how do you do that, especially when you're getting down to the human level in a very, very diverse region? Very difficult. Um, it, it takes a lot of effort. Um, the, the, the challenge is just to, just to list out a few, and you, you notice uh, as well as I do, different languages. There is a scarcity of resources, and I'm sure Stephen can uh, attest to that as well. Uh, there just aren't enough people who are trained in doing due diligence. Um, access to information, we know we have you know, Google and so on and so forth. There's the internet, but again, there's limitations because most of the news are going to be concentrated around English. Um, again, coming back to the resourcing expertise, um, particularly for North American-based companies, they tend to be centralized in the research and they tend to focus only on English. So you're missing out on a lot of uh, nuances. Um, and when it comes to um, the, the primary case and, and, and others, um, you almost need to have somebody on the ground really understanding uh, local culture. Uh, you need to understand um, uh, things beyond what you see in the media. Right? So it is very tricky. Secondly, uh, um, from a corporate resourcing perspective, um, if, if you just list out suppliers, 
uh, for your organizations, I'm sure there is, they'll be in the thousands, if not in the hundreds of thousands. How can you deal with that kind of volume? You have to uh, approach this based on risk. You have to tier it. Um, you know, many different ways of doing it by country, by um, by business volume, by reputational damage if something does go wrong. Uh, obviously, Apple will do very different due diligence in Foxconn than they would on a you know fourth tier supplier that uh, supplies them with office goods. Um, but it is very, very difficult, very resource intense. And this, I think, is where my earlier comment comes in. If you approach this from the perspective of just fulfilling your technical requirements or pleasing headquarters who will give you directives on you know, UK Bribery Act, FCPA, for those of you who work for uh, US institutions, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it becomes quite difficult. But if you put your heart into it and you actually see the more fundamental sense in what all of these rules, policies, and so on want to accomplish. Um, again, I think we'll all do, be doing a much better job in this. Actually, touching on to Soren's point, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the conversations I've certainly had, uh, it, it boils down to a couple of things which you, which you touched upon. I mean, one of them, when it does come to doing your due diligence, doing your screening, I've always believed in, you know, think local, not global. Right? In the sense, a lot of organizations we speak to, they say, we rely on these online databases. We rely on Google. We rely on this on access to here. But in a lot of the jurisdictions where we are seeing a lot of the incidences happening, happening a lot of it isn't online. A lot of it is in the local language. You know, so if you're going to take that global approach and see what's only available in English, there is a lot of information you're going to be missing out on. I mean, if we take China, for example, right, where a lot of companies are sourcing to um, uh, you know, they've got the most decentralized system in terms of corporate records. If you want to find out who really owns an organization, you can't just type it in on Google. Right? You know, you've got to go, for, in every city, district, province, you know, they have what you call the administration of industry and commerce. Right? And each AIC operates differently. And the amount of information that they disclose differs. Right? So a, finding the right AIC to begin with is challenge number one. And then seeing what information you know, is out there from that particular AIC is challenge. Uh, and also, if you look at the languages in, in this part of the world, I mean, very few of them, English is the main one. Right? Uh, and if you think about, so if, you know, again, if you look at China, uh, people love social media. People love uh, blogs. Right? It's, it's actually a very good source of intelligence. Yes, you know, it is a blog. You've got to take it with a pinch of salt. But if you have 100, 200 people complaining about the same issue regarding a particular company, that in itself provides a lot of intelligence. Uh, and then going on to Soren's other point, I mean, one of the like, biggest, another challenge a lot of our, I mean, a lot of companies face is around that risk-based approach. You know, how do you prioritize? Now, of course, a lot of it depends on the industry. A lot of it depends on you know where your risks lie. Uh, but you know, a lot of the question we ask them, what is your risk-based approach? They'll say, oh, we, we look at Transparency International, right? But that's just one way you can rank risk. There are so many other factors. You know, things like, is that partner, is that distributor, supplier, business critical? What function are they forming to my business? What's the value of that particular relationship? Right? And you know, for me, I think getting that risk-based approach right from the beginning is fundamental to any successful third-party screen. Interesting Hi, stuff. Adam. Yes, Steve. Yep. Sorry, it's on. Great. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, Steve Ferrer here. Uh, I better just declare that, uh, that uh, I work for a, an NGO, uh, so I was delighted to see Dean put that up in his opening slides, and I'm glad that we do apply pressure. But I'm actually a bit of a wolf in sheep's clothing because I'm actually a, a financial services compliance head, and I, I left that to join Liberty Asia. Um, just to pick up on a few points, I think um, one very key thing, and I think Soren will agree, is really tone from the top. Um, you, you can do compliance two different ways. One, you can do it to be defensible and auditable. Uh, and it can be a checklist and so on and so forth. But in my experience, uh, it doesn't actually do much good. It's good for you to defend. It's good for you to tell the regulators uh, what you're doing. Uh, but if you really want to stop uh, things happening in any of relationships, you need to go further than that. Uh, so in my time in a bank, we actually put together programs using uh, tools and techniques around the media, which were a very good early warning radar. And basically, we would run our clients and we would run our relationships against the media and pick up 
uh, certain keywords. And uh, now actually for Liberty Asia, we, we recommend the same thing to everybody we meet. Uh, we have a list of keywords that we, we would really love everyone to use in their screening programs, uh, which is just you know, human trafficking, forced labor, child exploitation, and so on. Uh, and once you start to embed that into your process, you start to pick up a much richer view of whether your clients are doing something uh, you know, nefarious or spurious or not quite with your, you know, in accordance with your values. So that's a very early, you know, very simple way of doing things into a, uh, and then obviously if you do pick up risk, then you actually need to consider where you reach out to due diligence vendors to actually help give you a far more detailed uh, uh, you know, uh, view uh, and something that you can actually take to management then and take a decision on. And that's the way I did it in the bank. Um, it worked very well. Uh, and uh, we found having that early warning radar gave us a view that we'd never had before. Uh, and I think it can work in this instance as well. So that was just a, a quick thought there. Just going to your point, I mean, look, we, we hear tone from the top all the time, right? It's, it, that's not exactly a new concept, right? But how, how do you effectively get what the senior managers want all the way down through to your employees? And it doesn't stop at the employee level. You know, I mean, a lot of the people, a lot of the issues around, you know, you know, sales, agents. So then are you getting them to do some sort of training in terms of what your expectations are, what your senior management expectations are about how they should act? Right? Uh, and again, I think this is one of the biggest challenges a lot of companies face. How do you get that tone all the way through the organization? And then does it stop at the end of the organization? Do you do classroom sessions, which seems to happen a lot? Do you go onto e-learning, for example? Um, you know, do you get them, do you get your suppliers of it to sign your code of conduct and then take a course to ensure they've understood that code of conduct? I mean, sorry, from your, your perspective, I mean, how do you get something like that, you know, from the top all the way through to, to, to everyone, or even Steve? Do you go first? <laughs> I think it helps if you have the right leader, that for sure, right? Um, it, it's. But um, I think we're seeing a new breed of corporate leaders who are incredibly focused on this, either on the consumer side because they're interested in branding or because they've seen a lot of bad stuff happening, particularly in financial services. Um, I do think it takes a strong um, legal and compliance person as well to remind people of the value of doing Right. It's, it, I think if you argue with uh, altruism, that's always kind of difficult. But once you speak numbers uh, and you can point out, uh, I've always found that very helpful uh, with uh, really hard-nosed business people. Once you figure out a way of showing a stock price going down because of a particular incident with a supply chain or, um, or any other issue, you can actually quantify the financial impact. And you can show the long-term financial impact on these things, particularly around uh, corruption and human trafficking, because typically, I'm not sure, there, there's a number of really good studies out there uh, from academia now that uh, essentially show it's not a short hit on your reputation, it's actually a long-run effect on your price. Once you can quantify it, it makes it a little bit easier to sell. And I think uh, if you're in a compliance uh, type role, um, if, if you have to defend code of conduct, uh, I would try out that approach. It has certainly worked for me. Let's get back to, to some of the practicalities. Uh, Steve, you mentioned uh, that interesting word search approach uh, as one way of, of getting into it. What other sort of practical measures do you think people can start to take in order to, to try and make that third party risk a little less risky? Is it um, being out in the field? Is it hiring yourself? What are some of the things that you see as the sort of the ABCs? Thank you. Great question. <laughs> um, you, you know, <clears throat> so Liberty Asia, we're focused on human trafficking, uh, and that's our, our focus. So what we do, bless you, um, what we do is we actually recommend, uh, we try to find champions, first of all, in a, an organization. Uh, and uh, I was the champion in my former organization. And I found that, uh, that all the, the meetings I requested with my senior management, when I started to talk about human trafficking, they would accept my email request. Whereas before, no way. So I actually found that it's a very, very powerful message to take all across the organization. Uh, so when I speak at various events, I always say, who would like to be a superhero? 
who would like to take on the mantle of trying something uh, and going and spreading that word. And a very simple way can be, uh, well, I did it three ways. First of all, we hosted Lunch at Learns, a bit like this, uh, where you just get 10, 20 friends in the, gr in the room, give them sandwiches, and you start to spread and grow. Uh, of course, it takes time on a big organization, but it does work. The second, I went to my head of uh, ESG, and I said, look, this is what we're doing. We should do something. Uh, and the way that the, co the co um, corporation presents itself. So he actually changed the uh, public-facing statements to say, we are no longer going to do business with these areas and any hint of human trafficking or a child labor. So that, to me, was a big win, because that pushed out our values to both our, our external facing, but also internally. And the third thing, really, was we actually got posters made. So every branch of uh, the organization I used to work for, uh, all across the world, they have big posters now saying, we will not do business with anything to do with human trafficking. So it got people very focused on this issue. Uh, and then people can start to uh, add in their um, thoughts, their ideas, their energy, their passion, uh, and the whole organization starts to move forward. So it doesn't happen overnight, but that's just one way we manage to get change internally and we get people to buy in. And it's not something that you're telling them to do, it's something you're encouraging them to do. And I found that was uh, hugely powerful. Interesting and, and powerful, and, but beyond the values, because I think for many of us based in Asia and headquarters in the US or in London, there's this bottom line you've got to hit, and actually the realities on the ground are quite different. So what sort of practical steps do you, do you take sort of on a daily, weekly basis to make sure that you're actually doing things in a compliant way? I think firstly it comes down to having the right tools and having the right resources. Um, so if, if you haven't done so, you've got to ask for the right resources, right? If you don't have enough people looking at things, you will not be able to fulfill your mission. Uh, you won't be able to do the training to Dean's point. You won't uh, be able to get the word out. Um, so it's it's both a monitoring as well as a um, education uh, to everyone out there who is representing you. Secondly, access to information. For the most part, the good news is this is actually very cheap. Internet doesn't cost you much. Um, we have Google and other search engines that work reasonably well. Um, there are limitations, and I think it's important to know about these limitations. Uh, this is where you know service providers come in, not to give a plug for Thomson Reuters, but uh, they're actually doing this really well. And that is, uh, uh, the internet doesn't necessarily archive everything, um, but they will. And so they'll have a lot more access to articles than you would find if you really have a critical relationship. So knowing the limitations of uh, uh, information access certainly helps as well. Um, and then just go the extra step. Don't just assume that because you haven't found anything in the first five minutes of search that there isn't anything. Right? So celebrate, I think, as an organization, you've got to celebrate these cases where somebody went beyond. Uh, and and, and we, we just had a case like this a couple of weeks ago um, at Manulife. And uh, through somebody's really great work and, and just being based, having basic alertness, um, we managed to avert uh, one of these uh, uh, cases, and our Asia CEO, when he heard about it uh, in our regular catch-up, said, give me the name of that junior analyst, and personally reached out to that junior analyst. The word will spread. Interesting. Steve, what about in, in terms of working with NGOs? Yeah. Uh, in some ways, they're very different occupations. Interesting that you've done both. But how can companies actually benefit from all the work that NGOs do and the change that you're trying to affect? Are there practical ways? Actually, that's a really good point, Tara. And, uh, you know, Dean was talking about on the ground uh, visibility. Uh, I think most people have overlooked NGOs as being a very valid source. Uh, they are on the ground. They do know what's going on. Uh, but they're typically, uh, just by their nature, very uh, wary, very reluctant about big corporate businesses coming to ask some questions. Um, so actually, there's one reason why we exist at Liberty Asia. We are all ex-corporates, uh, and we actually try to be the bridge between the NGOs and, and uh, corporations. 
uh, and we work very closely with Thomson Reuters as well, just to give the plug. Um, but what we're trying to do at the moment, in fact, is uh, we actually go and understand what they're looking at uh, and what they see. Uh, and we actually try and harness that information and make that available uh, through various platforms to business decision makers to make better business decisions. So at the moment, we're working very much on fishing uh, in Thailand. Uh, and we have found a number of NGOs on the ground there who can actually give us information that no one else has and no one else has bothered to ask. Uh, and it's a rich source, and we are able to, to harness that and collate that and pass that through uh, to, to various business, business decision makers. But to, your, to answer your question, Tara, because I don't think I've completely answered it, is, are they a rich source? Yes. Are they very dependable? It varies. Uh, and can you trust them? Yes and no. Uh, they have their own agenda. Uh, often they're there uh, and they're supported for a certain purpose, and that sometimes does not align very well with business interests. Um, so a lot of them are, are, in our part of the world, they're very interested in, in raid and rescue, uh, rescuing people out of prostitution. Uh, they do not care about business or business involvement. Their focus is really to arrest, sorry, rescue as many people as they can. But they actually understand what's going on, uh, and, and they can be very helpful. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and to both of you, really, beyond that, what about local contacts? Um, whether you're working in China, and that can put some people at risk in China to go out and do due diligence, or whether you want some information on the ground in Cambodia. How, how much are you at the behest of a good local contact to get information for you? I think it's short very much so. Um, many countries have built up barriers. You mentioned China. Um, not only the access to the official corporate databases, but uh, there are very severe limitations to how much due diligence you can do now. Um, it, you know, there, there, there was a very high profile case, obviously, last year, criminalizing some of the uh, investigation, investigative work, which isn't always helpful from a financial crimes perspective. Um, on the ground, I think you're very much dependent on having an ethical, local investigative team. And I personally found uh, in, in, in our work that your best bet is somebody who has deep resources, deep connections. Um, I, I would agree with Steve, most companies aren't tapping into enough into uh, the NGOs who will have a lot of uh, intelligence. Um, so unfortunately, um, your best bet still remains to hire a company that specializes, and there are a number of them out there, but that specializes in this uh, type of services, which, coming back to your point, what do we do on a day-to-day basis? These searches will easily cost you three, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, and oftentimes uh, getting that money out of your CEO or business unit is going to be difficult. So, but actually, sorry, on that point about you know sources of information, um, you know, I think people might like, underestimate a little bit how much information there is out there for them to grab hold of. Right? Uh, but I think the key thing is making sure that what information you do access and use as part of your research, as part of your due diligence, does come from publicly accessible sources. Right? Uh, the reason, well, one of the reasons is the fact that you know if someone questions or says, "How did you find that out?" You've got to have some form of trail saying, we've done the research, this is where we got it, this is the source of information. Right? It just makes it a little bit more credible. Um, now, of course, the, you know, the, there are ways, but, you know, from a due diligence perspective, we call it business intelligence. Right? But if you want to go down to that more local level, um, you know, it's, it's a way of, I like to describe it, it's sort of journalistic type interviews with people on the ground who may know of the subject or are in that industry who can provide you know, a little bit more insight, a little bit more depth and knowledge about a particular subject or a particular individual or company. Uh, you know, that, that sort of borderline to sort of private investigator S, uh, so it, it's, it's a fairly gray area, but you know, people and companies do have the, that sort of ability to go down to that local level, especially if you want to get someone's insight about a reputation. You know, their reputation might not be online, but you speak to people on the ground, oh, this company has a bad reputation. Why is that? Oh, they're involved in this, they're involved in scandal, they cheat customers. And you won't get that sort of intelligence unless you are going down to that local level. 
Steve, I know you've been on a few flights already just this week, so you obviously get around the region a fair amount. What, what areas of the region do you say are the most challenging in terms of getting a real sense of what's going on uh, on the ground, even if you're on the ground yourself? That's a very good question. I, I think probably the biggest challenge is corruption. Uh, and there are certain countries uh, you know, that we all know uh, where corruption is king. Uh, and that makes uh, life for everybody very difficult to get good information um, ethically. Uh, you can get it, but it, it might not come the right path. Um, it also makes a lot of pressure on NGOs. Uh, so there are certain countries in ASEAN, because of corruption, NGOs find it very difficult to operate. Uh, they're very scared that they will have a, a, you know, a 4 a.m. knock on the door uh, and then get kicked out. So we've seen that start to happen in certain markets where they've trodden on toes because they're digging quite deep uh, and uh, you know, NGOs have suddenly found their, their, their visas have been cancelled. Um, I think that's one issue. Uh, I think it really is um, also, is there's a need uh, to understand what's happening. Uh, so if we're sitting in Hong Kong, as you said before, Tara, um, how do you understand what's happening in Cambodia or Laos or Myanmar? Um, typically, you will not be re reading Khmer media. You won't know what's been reported in Cambodia. Um, and you won't bother, but you're missing a gold mine. And that's where you really do need to uh, either fine tune your systems to be able to pull that in yourself or use other third party uh, uh, providers. So I'll just give you an example of this, just if you don't mind, for one second. So uh, we've been working on a lot of, lot of cases in Cambodia about uh, um, a nation not too far north of here uh, where they've been uh, actually sourcing uh, ladies to go and work in factories in that country. And they've been sourcing them in Cambodia. But those ladies, when they go to this nation further north, um, they're not going to uh, work in factories. They're going to be sold off to farmers in the west of this nation. Uh, and the going price is about 10,000 US dollars. So um, this is happening on a large scale. How many of you knew that? One, two, two and a half. Sorry, three. Yeah. You know, so we're in a room of 60 people, only three people knew that. But all of those transactions are happening in US dollars. And all the banks in, in Cambodia operate in US dollars. And they have correspondent banking relationships with banks here and all over the globe. So if you're a banker and you have not done a, a better check on your relationships with banks in Cambodia and what sort of transactions are coming through the pipe, you are putting yourself at risk that you're handling funds on behalf of these marriage brokers from China. And there are also people recruiting for uh, illegal fishing vessels. And they're also recruiting for all kinds of things. So what I'm trying to say is you really do need that local perspective, perspective as Soren was saying. Uh, but how do you get it from here in Hong Kong or anywhere else? You do need to use a wide variety of tools. So we've talked about you know, desktop tools, uh, due diligence service providers, and so on. But you do need to find that information. Because uh, if you don't, you're exposing yourself very simply. Um, I hope that makes sense and, and answers some of the question anyway. Yeah. Absolutely. And Soren, in terms of what your sort of flashing caption areas are, corruption or a particular part of Asia, what do you see as sort of the biggest worries? Where are the biggest challenges? I think, again, the, the, the biggest challenge for me is not, is not so much uh, in some countries getting the information or knowing that these are hot spots. You know, Transparency International has a pretty good chart on this that's fairly intuitive and probably can be corroborated uh, just by us traveling around in the region, um, just going through passport controls and so on. Um, however, um, I think if, if you're in the risk management compliance legal operational uh, business, I think the, the biggest challenge that we're up against is this kind of treatment, particularly uh, if you have independent business units in those countries, who will, how often do you hear, oh, but it's, it's done like that, we'll lose our business, we have to do it. Like any of the cases I think that Dean showed, you look at uh, GSK in China and any, any other high profile case, almost guaranteed those same conversations went on 
where people in the organization thought, I've got to hit my sales targets, uh, we've got to be in the business, but all of our suppliers, you know, I've got to uh, get these wine bottles into my hotel uh, because we're running out of stock. How do you do that? How do you expedite? Um, and there's a million reasons, a million excuses that all of us can come up with, both in our personal as well as professional lives, um, not to fight corruption. Uh, and that, I think, is the bigger challenge. We, we know where the risks are. We know where the hot spots are. Um, but getting that internal resistance, having people buy into not only this legalistic notion of, oh, you know, some, some government made this a, a, a law that applies anywhere in the world, but we don't really believe in it, to this is a real issue. This, is, this, is, this, this increases the cost for everyone and ultimately is really, really bad for business, for the community, for the country itself. Could I just add on to Soren's point, because I think it's a very key one, is also if you outsource to your local operations, uh, you may not realize the connections that they have locally. Um, it could be good, it could be otherwise. Um, and, and that's where I think is a, in a regional uh, role, you, you do have to not just bring uh, best practices in there, but you have to take a very careful view. And that might be something you need to do before you uh, push authority down to a local operation is is really, is that the right decision to make? And you might need to con you know, get a consultant in to come and tell you, what are the dynamics in this market? You know, how nepotistic is it? How corrupt is it? If I give my country head responsibility to do all the vetting, are they going to do that for the best interests of the company or the best interests of their family? Uh, and that's certainly true in certain markets that I've been in recently. So. Complex. And we've got about 15 minutes left, so I want to make sure we get time for some questions. So if you want to raise your hand, um, I'm happy to bring a mic around to you and let us know your name and organization if you're comfortable with that. Should we start over here? Hi, I'm Richard Newberry. I'm with LGS Asia. We do the due diligence type of thing. Thank you. The one comment you made about the media, one of the things you have to be careful of is what that media's bias is. Mm -hmm. Because you're dealing with uh, like RF News, which is the Russian Federation News, which has a very pro-Russia stance. Mm -hmm. So its invasion of Ukraine or Crimea is perfectly legal and perfectly good and, and mm -hmm. it's good for everybody. So you've got to look at not only the source of information, which could be something that you're looking for, but you've got to look at what their bias is. So, you know, and if you're relying on internet news, um, you know, I've seen so many flaky agencies mm -hmm. that are saying outrageous things and people are lapping it up because it's on the internet. Yeah. So that's one of the things we have to look at as well in, in being people that are uh, the due diligence servers. We also look at who's saying what and what their bias is. I mean, I think the thing about due diligence, right? I mean, to me, it's about helping our clients or help clients being able to make that sensible business decision. Right? You can use all these sources, and you've got to look at all that information, and you've got to analyze where it's coming from, like you said. I mean, the report shouldn't tell you yes or no to a particular transaction. It's great if it does. But what it should do is give you the intelligence and the information that you need for you guys to then decide whether or not it's worth proceeding with that particular relationship. And we've seen you know, time and time again where you know, biased news sources, and I get it a lot with, uh, often with relationship managers at private banks, where they want to onboard a particular customer, compliance is saying no, bank is saying yes. And then there's this whole spiel about where this information came from. You know, it's a biased source, it's this, it's, it's not right. But the point of the report is for the organization to make that decision whether or not it is the right information and whether or not it is okay to proceed. Dean and I have had that conversation over the past uh, probably four years, many, many different times, uh, as you can imagine. I think you, you raised an excellent point. Um, also, when you look at countries such as, uh, and I'm just randomly picking examples, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, even if you find negative news that are seemingly credible, you always, as a due diligence professional, have to evaluate, um, is if that's something that is politically motivated. You, you know, Malaysia, this whole uh, 1MDB saga right now with the Prime Minister being cleared, then allegations, allegations again. If you have a due diligence report on that, 
obviously there is some red flags, but how credible are the red flags? Whereas in some other uh, instances when media just is afraid of saying anything negative, the lack of anything uh, in the media also doesn't mean everything is fine. So you've got to look at it from both angles, and that is exactly where, where Dean is spot on. Um, if you do use service providers, they should not give you a yes or no answer. It should be you and the organization benchmarking that against your risk appetite, but also making sure you work with your local teams who have a much better understanding, almost guaranteed, than somebody sitting in New York, Toronto, London, or somewhere else, making that assessment and, and putting uh, all of that into context. And of course, documenting why and how you arrived at that conclusion, I think, is key as well. Verification, verification of verifications is, is something you've got, to, you've got to do that. There's no way around it. If somebody says the sky is green, and you go, well, the sky is green, so we can't do that. You've got to have a second source of, of information that says, actually, yeah, the sky is actually green. You've got to be very careful of, of single source information. I mean, in journalism or in Reuters, we always say second pair of eyes on everything or some, a, a source and then another source. Do you have a number of sources that you would say is enough to make it legit? Or do you just feel there's a point where you, you get it? Is there a, a number you would attach to it to make sure it's... I, I hesitate to say, yes, you've got to have five or you've got to have three or two. But second source information is, is critical at the very minimum. Is a second source of information verifying the first source. I, mean, I know from a, a world check database perspective, always has to be minimum two sources. At minimum. Uh, usually it's three plus. So for ourselves, we'll go with a single source, but we have a secret weapon. We can actually go back to an NGO on the ground and say, is that true? And what's your thought on that? And that's something that we, you know, we, we actually value very much, is that we have that ability to go and and get a second pair of eyes, but not a media source or an online source. I'm, I, I want to open it up to questions, but the NGO thing just reminded me that being an NGO in China is getting more difficult. So given the size of China and the complexity of the problem, are we in for more problems, really, in terms of due diligence, etc.? cetera? Uh, I couldn't really comment much about China. <laughs> not in this day and age. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I value my, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think just a, a slightly different tangent. So the way, um, you know, when we were looking at all the examples before that Dean put up there, the one thing that struck me is all of these examples have come down, the way I see it, has come down to one thing, which is cost, cost of manufacture, cost of doing business. And that's the bit that, from our perspective, we see being squeezed time and time again. And that's where it opens up rife to human trafficking and slavery. Uh, because it's always other things, raw materials and so on, there is a, you know, a price point. But the bit they can squeeze is, is, is cost uh, of you know, the labor. Um, and you know, just to give you some perspective on this, is, you know, 30 million people is the latest estimate in slavery. Uh, all around the world. It's no, there's no nation that is uh, not tainted by this. Um, and it's a, it's a byproduct of globalization. Uh, and, you know, often people tout globalization as being a good thing, but no one says that this is the bad side. Uh, and really, you know, what I would like to throw out to the audience, if you don't mind, is, is it actually, it's our generation that caused this problem. You know, we're the ones that put greed uh, beyond as a key paramount uh, value. Uh, and that's why I really encourage people to please uh, work with us, and uh, I mean the collective us, uh, to actually stop this. Because I, I'm sure many in the room have children, uh, myself included, and Dean soon to be. Um, you know, and is this something that we really want to hand on to, to that generation of children? Uh, this problem with all of these things. So sometimes I, I've been on many conferences and we, we talk about the the, the, the granularity of how we do things, but I just wanted to put this in now is, is this bigger picture view of why we're talking about this. It is that there are human lives that are being abused and used to give us our goods, our, 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 our prawn, our, our trainers, our t-shirts. Uh, and it's not so much just the process of stopping this, it's really why are we doing it? What are we trying to achieve? We want to put people, give people's lives back. So that's, that's where we come from.
Uh, it's very much a personal thing, a passionate thing, and we, we're here to help you as well. So if you do need uh, our help, if you do need contact to NGOs, then, then come and find me afterwards and give me your card. We're happy to help. Sorry. Not at all. Um, more questions? Right over here. Thank you. Patrick Trainer from Cornerstone Strategic Partners. You mentioned um, getting a number of background checks, two, three, whatever the magic number is in your company. That's all well and good because sometimes it works. But as you mentioned also, you don't always know who the ownership really resides in in a specific uh, factory. And we found in, um, in sourcing of many different kinds of products that um, you may place an order with a factory that's passed all of your checks in terms of ownership and quality. Um, but what you haven't done is to say, what's the capacity utilization of that factory? Is Nike using that factory? Is someone else using that factory? How much of that factory, how many widgets per hour, hours per day, days per week, can this factory produce whatever my order is? And can they deliver it to the portal on a certain day? And uh, someone only like a, maybe a forensic accountant or the head of your QAQC located somewhere in Asia can actually go in and look at the factory and say, yes, they have enough machines. Yes, they have enough capacity. Because if they say, no, there's no way they can do it, What's happening? Well, part of your production is being shunted off to a factory that's not listed anywhere, that is probably not going to meet all the parameters. And it's probably owned by one of the owners of the factory. But you can't look and you can't find that on the internet. You can't find that on paper. You actually have to have boots on the ground. And what we found is that, like you said, it's a top-down approach. Your CEO has to buy into it and the CEO has to have a direct line to the compliance people who have to have a direct line to the managing director of your sourcing operation. Because if the sourcing, if the MD of the sourcing operation can actually get in and look at that factory and make those calculations with the help of, say, a forensic accounting, all of the internet checking in the world isn't going to work. Thanks. It's not easy being in business, right? <laughs> right up here, yes. Hi, I'm with uh, Sandler Training and Gallup Organization. Um, I'm looking at speakers, and you've got Manual Life and Thompson. I'm a Canadian. You're both headquartered in Canada. So in Canada, I like to think that we're very ethical, we're very transparent, and there's a very strong culture of doing business the right way. But then you're thousands of miles from the boardroom in Toronto, mm -hmm. and you're doing business in Asia. And sometimes when I ask people about behavior and why things get off the rails, they say that's just the way it's done here. So how important is culture in changing the mindsets of some of these places and some of these industries and some of the challenges? Because the reality is mid single digit growth for China is a new reality and the new challenge. So the difference between the boardroom and then say frontline sales or whoever's going out there meeting your clients or if supply chain, it's supply chain, but how do you educate and change culture? And it comes back to large sheet point from the top. Um, if, if you do testing, which you have to do, right? If you do testing um, and you find issues, <laughs> which inevitably almost all the time you will, um, if you have local offices, you've got to take swift action. It's got to be made public in the organization to signal to everyone else that it's just not tolerable behavior. Right? You've got to bring in transparency I think moving people around, and that is both ways, not just, you know, in your example, Canadians to China operation, but also the other way around will go a long way. Um, you have to have patience. It, it won't be changed overnight, so the culture will come up over many years rather than overnight. It's not enough to do one training. Uh, Germany, so I'm always remembering the Siemens example after uh, there are now um, three FCPA charges. Uh, the response was, we'll do more training. We hire a very famous compliance person, uh, but nothing changed after that, right? Uh, so, it, and they were exactly faced with that, uh, with that problem in, in different uh, countries. Transparency, centralization, I mentioned testing, I think they're all key. Uh, so trust but verify, the old, uh, good old compliance principle I think helps. Um, and uh, rewarding compliant behavior, even if at times it does cost you business, 
promoting that to say we're consciously walking away from a bad deal, making that public, but also cele uh, celebrating successes when you do kind of cut off uh, uh, a, a bad apple and making that very public uh, so people will learn. Because you've got to turn that into people's personal interests until they finally change that into that ethical culture. I, I, can I just pick up on that? Because I, I, what Soren said there I think is, is huge. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's rewarding good behavior uh, rather than punishing bad. You know, that, that has to change in organizations. Uh, and I think some get it. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, you know, some of the sort of wacky things we did when I was in another organization was just getting that culture of change going. But, you know, posters uh, rewarding uh, people for good, doing the right decisions uh, rather than not always the, the best business decision, but the good, the right thing to do. Um, I think I was talking to someone last night, actually, who was a compliance, uh, legal compliance guy. And we were saying, how, do, how can you say that your training is effective? Because everyone goes through training and they all pass, but does that actually change what they do? Uh, and he said, in a very good comment, he said, it depends on if you see an increase in the number of whistleblower cases and the number of you know, bad deals being flagged up to management for review. And if you start to see that, then you know your training has been effective and your culture is changing. He said, if, you, if it's the same old, same old, or gets worse, you're wasting your time. It's just a tick box exercise. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of different dynamics to it, but that just, uh, I thought it was a really good point that you made. We have a question over here. Hello, um, my name is Bonnie from Dunabad Street. I got two questions. The first one will be for, uh, for Sorens. Actually, uh, lately, regulators are talk talking about individual accountabilities. They're checking the uh, management appetite to uh, shifting some liability to the frontline officers. I would like to see your comments on this, whether you will increase the investment of the compliance uh, checks, or you, you see the, 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 the pressures on that. And the second one would be uh, like a, uh, for Steve. It's like a, uh, I heard some clients uh, uh, talking about the uh, number of false positives. It's like they don't want too much, and they don't want too little. I would like to hear your comments. The optimum <coughs> level of false positives. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, should we start? <laughs> so moving to the front line. So I, I'm not sure if that can solve some problem in China, possibly. So just would like to hear your comment. Um, I I hope we're moving towards that direction. I know most of regulators are saying that they are. Um, I have yet to see a regulator come into a company doing an audit where they first meet with Frontline and ask very simple questions such as, who is your AML compliance officer? Right? And I'm fairly certain that in many organizations, they would get a stare blank to say, I've never met with that person. I don't know who that person is. I don't know my compliance people because they're in some back office in a remote location, and I don't want to see them. Um, that, that transition, I haven't seen. I've, I've seen the statements. I've seen the uh, general concept. I haven't seen enforcement cases. Um, what I have seen is uh, uh, FCA in, in the UK and some other regulators in the US, obviously, as well, um, grabbing compliance people and making them personally accountable. So in, 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 in theory, what you're saying is right. That should be meaning we're moving to frontline uh, uh, responsibilities. In reality, um, I'm seeing the opposite trend. And with compliance department coming to your question on resourcing, uh, are, are, we, are we staffing up like everybody else we are? Um, but that creates its own issues, and that is um, frontline and management will say, but now if you increased uh, your compliance staff by another 20% this year, and you're specialized, you're the guys who are hired to do this stuff, not me. Mm -hmm. um, so you're almost creating a disincentive to take things back into frontline. And I think your best chance really is, uh, particularly when it comes to supply chain, consumer business, and so on, making sure that people and your managers this is where a strong compliance person needs to come in and say, 
you are you should be responsible not because you fear the regulators or because it's uh, it's your uh, uh, paper responsibility, but this makes business sense. Right? You just cannot afford, from a business perspective, to take a reputational hit. You know, I mean, we're, we're talking about keeping out of the headlines, right? That should be in the interest of every single CEO, every single salesperson, every single business unit manager. And if you start reminding them of that rather than the theoretical, which I have yet to see, a scenario of any pay clawback or them being fired over some issue, um, that gives you a much better chance at uh, succeeding and moving in that right direction. Steve, quick final note, because we're, we've gone beyond the bewitching hour. Um, I can tell we've scratched the surface. We'll have another round of this. Another perhaps time. I could answer your question separately on, uh, later on, uh, because it's, there's a various factors. And it's, it, I think it's really about, you know, uh, for bankers. Uh, and I think in the room there are more than bankers. So perhaps I could just talk to you afterwards. Thank you. So before we go, um, and I hope we'll have time for some conversation after, some key takeaways. I think it's important to leave the room with some key takeaways. Maybe, Soren, you can start by just giving me one sentence of what you think you maybe learned or saw today as the key point to leave the room with. I think one key takeaway for me was uh, are we tapping enough into organizations such as Steve's? And I think the answer is no. Uh, certainly something that, and I've been doing this for a while, that I wasn't aware of. Steve. Uh, only one sentence, are you sure? Yep. Uh, okay. Um, I, I, like I said, I think this is an issue that is, uh, really fits on our generation to solve. Uh, and that's why I really encourage all of you to, to uh, you know, work together, uh, come and talk to, to all of us how do we work this together? That's a bit more of a sentence, but yeah. I think there were some commas, but that was, that okay. was just okay. <laughs> Dean, a, a final note. Yeah, for me, it's, it's go beyond adequate procedures. Don't just do the basic. Try to take that next step. I'm sorry we have to leave it here. We've just scratched the surface. I think there's room for conversation uh, around the room for another half an hour or so. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much to our guests for um, some very illuminating ideas and thoughts. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.